feeling a person has during that critical moment can only be described through the traditions of the Messenger of God, the Holy Quran, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, as no one really has gone through that experience and was able to report back what they felt on a sensory level. And the traditions highlight for us that there is an experience of either two polar opposites. Either someone feels a sense of solace, a sense of relief, as if in similitude to taking off old dirty clothing and wearing fresh, brand new, clean ones. And that's an experience everyone enjoys. And so that process of the naz'a, one of the terminologies that is used in referring to the ripping of the soul, is expressed in that manner. There is a polar opposite sensory experience as well, which one can imagine is extremely excruciating. It is reserved for those that were a beacon of injustice, of oppression, and Allah will ensure that that phase and that stage will not be one they will enjoy. And it will feel like an eternity, when in reality, it was only a glimpse of a second. The moment of death is the moment of separation between the body and the soul. A state of intoxication, a state of confusion. However, for the believers, we believe that it will be a moment of peace, it will be a moment of comfort. This person is in a state of intoxication, a state of confusion. However, for the believers, we believe that it will be a moment of peace, it will be a moment of comfort. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says in a hadith describing death, he says, Either at that moment for a person, it is being told that you have eternal pleasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or, بِشَارَةٌ بِعَذَابِ abad, Meaning that you are told that you're going to be in a state of suffering forever. Or, a third category is someone who is in between. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what will happen to them. And this is also perhaps something that many of the believers, many of the people, they will be in. The moment of death is also referred to as the moment of ihtidhar. Ihtidhar means the moment where everyone is attending. The person that is dying, they see their whole life in front of their eyes. They see their family, they see their children, they see their wealth that they have accumulated. And then they also see shaitan. They see powers that try to push this person to do kufr in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels are also present. And our teachings tell us that even Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt, the soul of Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt are also present. So this is why it is referred to as the moment of ihtidhar, meaning everyone is hadir, everyone is present at that particular moment. When the angel of death comes to take the soul of the believer, the angel of death comes in the most beautiful fashion and he takes the soul of the believer in the most easy and beautiful of ways but for the non-believer obviously it's completely different it's a much more difficult situation now having said that we do also have traditions that allah azza wa jal may make those final moments that are called sakarat al maut ihtadar difficult even on the believer why to purify him from his sins. He might have some sins remaining. Allah doesn't want him to carry those sins to the grave. So Allah uses that time of sakrat al maut to purify that individual. So the traditions tell us that the angel of death comes, he drags the soul out of the body until it reaches the throat. And the Quran speaks about this. The Quran says, Hatta idha balagat al taraqi. Taraqi is this area of the throat. So the soul reaches there. حَتَّى إِلَىٰ بَلَغَةَ التَّرَاقِ وَقِيلَ مَنْ رَاقِ And it's like he's choking. He's choking because his soul is coming out. And people will say, is there anyone to cure that individual? But they don't know this is the matter of Allah. وَظَنَّ أَنَّهُ الْفِرَاقِ But then they know this is Allah's death. وَالْتَفَّتِ السَّاقُ بِالسَّاقِ The Quran uses this expression. That the feet, the legs are twisted with each other. It's as if it's a very tense situation. 
إلى ربك يومئذ المساق. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the destination. So it could be difficult even for the believer, but it's only to purify his sins. We have a glimpse that is provided to us by Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al and elsewhere that speaks of angels granting glad tidings. They will tell the believer that in this final moment we are here to hold your hand. We are here to lead you through this confusing, uh, arduous, and rather tumultuous process. It's on foreign territory, it's a frontier that you've personally never been through or to, and so you will get the aid of those that will help you. And the descriptions are very beautiful. You see, for example, that upon visiting any member of the Imam of Ahlul Bayt, the hadith is clear that they will ensure you will also be visited. And whatever you've given, you shall also receive. Your deeds will manifest. And it's a beautiful experience that the more you delve into, the more you actually begin to long for this moment. Whereas a disbeliever, one can only imagine. Um, the hadith give us um, some description of what they go through. But the reality is it's much more immense and intense. Everyone is subject to the extrapolating of the soul through the angel of death, Malik al-Mawt. Malik al-Mawt will appear in different forms for the believer, the non-believer, and those in between. For the non-believer, he is described as one of the most um, hideous, most complicated things. You will not enjoy his presence. Um, any disbeliever on that day will have the thought, I wish I believed. I wish I wasn't the cruel human and person I was on God's earth when God gave me so many chances. Just in this moment, you haven't even entered Barzakh, you haven't even gone through the grave, you haven't even been in the phase of Qiyamah, but now already there's this fault. There's this, I wish I would have gone back because now I missed out. The believer will see their place and their position in Jannah and they will see that what they're leaving behind in this dunya, in this lower dunya, is nothing compared to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will promise them and will give them in the afterlife, will compensate them with in the afterlife. Whereas the kafir, they will see that they are going to a new house, they're going to a new realm that they did not prepare for, that they did not plan for. And therefore, they will feel that this dunya, which is nothing, is much greater for them than what the Akhirah is going to hold for them. And this is why many of the kuffar or the kuffar that are described in the Quran, they will say, When the kafir sees what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed ahead of them and for them, they will say, Please allow me to go back so that I can do good deeds and build my afterlife. We have a tradition that refers to the Messenger of God and Amir al-Mu'mineen being present in those critical and dangerous moments, such that they are there to ease and bring a sense of tranquility and itma'nina to the one that is suffering. And those are the people that were forbearant in affirming the teachings of the Messenger and the Wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The hadith by Imam al-Sadiq makes mention that one day Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was asked, will those who despised you meet you? He says, yes. And they will meet me in the way that they despised me. Then also you will have the Mu'alun, those that expressed utmost beautiful sincerity, commitment, loyalty to the Imam, they will meet the Imam in that same way they've expressed utmost beautiful sincerity and commitment with the Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen These narrations tell us that the Mu'mineen, the believers, they will see the Ahlul Bayt and they will see Rasulullah and they will see Amir al-Mu'mineen at the time of death. And that moment is going to be a very difficult moment because everyone will feel a separation. They will have to separate from everything that they're attached to in this dunya. But then, 
what will make that separation be much easier is when they see the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when they see the face of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And the hadith tells us that Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt and Amir al-Mu'mineen, they will show their belie the believer their place in the Akhirah and they will tell the believer what you had ahead of, what you have ahead of you is much greater than what you are leaving behind you. Then the mu'min will say, I'm ready to go. The soul and body began not attached. They were not linked. Then they were linked upon the generation of being formed in the womb of our mothers. Then they only were in that relationship for the time period of this dunya, then they will split again and the spirit changes its form contingent on the manner its nafs allowed it to be and how the nafs behaved. If you were someone that was abrasive and rude, the spirit becomes affected in that manner. Hence the traditions make mention that on the day of judgment, you will see there are people that look healthy and they look fine and they are in the best of status physically speaking they are illuminating and then there are those that look unhealthy and weak and small what's the difference it is contingent on when they were a nafs how was it like did they prioritize allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did they prioritize themselves according to our teachings death is not the end death is just a transition of the soul from one realm to another realm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about death in the Quran as a form of creation. It's a form of life. Allah says in Surah Al-Mulk, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Tabarak al-Ladhi biyadih al-Mulk, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir, al-Ladhi khalaq al-Mawta wal-Hayat. Allah says God created death and then created life. What does this mean? This means that death is a transition from one realm to another. Some people, non-believers, they have the idea that death is the end. That's it, total annihilation. There's nothing left of this person. While we, the believers, the mu'mineen, we believe that death is moving from one house to another house. Moving from one realm to another realm. From this dunya to the akhirah. And the process of that movement is the separation of the body from the soul. Here we are in the body washing uh, room where it facilitates uh, the whole process from beginning to end of storing and washing all through the Islamic process uh, with dignity and respect to uh, the person coming through. The muqtasal is a very integral uh, process in the burial of a, of a mu'min uh, whereby the number one priority is maintaining the dignity of the individual. And that includes by avoiding looking at them as, uh, as necessary, as well as making sure they're handled with care. So you find a lot of uh, attention is brought meticulously to ensuring that only what is needed will be done. Um, and everything else will be made clear once we one day either participate in this or we one day are a viewer of this process because spiritually we understand that the soul until the body is buried remains roaming around its body and so it will begin witnessing as it's here so one day there will be a moment we will all observe the process being done to ourselves and so that's why in the narrations it is highly encouraged to at mustahab to actually participate in facilitating washing it may not necessarily be you wash someone completely that has passed but you at least help contribute knowing that one day i'm going to be in that position which helps ease that shock or that sadma that um, disbelief that when the soul is watching this it's like i've seen this before so it'll help with the process Once a person passes away, 
the soul separates from the body. However, the soul, according to our narrations, will hover around the body and it will be able to see certain things that, the, that are going on. The soul will be able to see. After one of the battles, Rasulullah he saw the bodies and the corpse of the kuffar and he began to speak to them. He tells them, did you see what God promised you to be true? Because we saw what God promised us to be true. Some of the Muslims, they tell Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, how are you speaking to these dead bodies? How are they going to answer you? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells the Muslims, you do not hear better than them. They hear just as good as you hear. However, Allah has not given them the permission to speak. So we believe that a soul, even after death, the soul will comprehend what's going on. The soul of the deceased begins to hear the cries of the loved ones. The soul of the deceased hovers around the body and it stays watching what's going on. And this is why it is recommended that the night a person is, uh, dies in that very room that the person passed away in to keep a light on, to keep a candle on. Because the soul will feel a great sense of loneliness. Laylatul Wahsha, the night of loneliness. The first night in the grave and the first night of death. And this is why there are certain things that are recommended to perform on the first night of the burial and the first night a person dies, and that is giving sadaqah. Giving sadaqah which will relieve the soul of this marhum, of this person who has just passed away, of the loneliness that they are experiencing. Considering that the body has yet to be buried, the soul experience uh, irritation, it's irritable that my body has not allowed me to traverse into the akhirah, the barzakh, the qabr, but nor am I linked to the body, so I am not able to entertain the dunya. So there's a sense of irritation. Hence why it's very important that in these moments, the believer should not take too long, should get this process over with, but the process of washing the body ensures that the body is dignified the respects have been given to it. The grave, that is the eternal home. That is the lasting, that is the final resting place of this person. You see in this dunya, people fight over land, over acres of land. At the end, all that we take with us is one grave. One grave which is very narrow and very tight. For a mu'min, the grave is going to feel as if it's a garden in paradise. And for the kafir, for the non-believer, the one who has rejected God, the one who has oppressed, the grave will be a very tight, narrow ditch in the hellfire, according to our teachings and traditions. The burial is a very interesting moment. The hole that is dug, there are particular requirements for it. Uh, on a social level, it must be one that is in an area among other mu'mineen, Again, emphasizing the dignity aspect of the deceased, that you don't bury them with non-Muslims or in an area that is not allocated as a burial ground. And so the process on that level also carries so many requirements only to emphasize and highlight that you are going to be dignified until the last shovel is put over and um, used on that hole. Then the grave turns into this physical to spiritual dimension. The tradition from the Holy Prophet of Islam indicates that the qabr or the grave can either be a rawda, a garden from the gardens of paradise, or a hufra from the pits of hellfire. It can either be one of these two things. Maybe not physically, but now since the spiritual dimension has been invoked, the body begins to decay, but the spirit begins to traverse the spiritual dimension and dynamics beginning with their grave. According to the hadith of Rasulullah, the deceased will be able to hear the sandals walking on the ground of those who are leaving, of the family, they're leaving the grave. As soon as they leave, angels will come to this person and they will begin to interrogate him. Because after death, a person will be able to see reality. Now you're going to be able to see the reality of things. So now 
the marhum is the soul is awakened in the grave and they tell this person we are questioning you of course the questioning begins about god about the quran about the prophet about the imams of the ahl bayt about the qibla and the main tenets of religion the main principles of religion they must be known and every person will be asked of course, our narrations tell us that the mu'mineen, the believers, they're going to be received by two angels by the name of Mubashir wa Bashir, meaning these are the angels that give glad tidings. They give glad tidings to the person who is in the grave. And the non-believer and the munafiq, they're going to be questioned by two angels by the name of Munkar wa Nakir. Those are the frightening angels that will ask questions and according to our narrations, if the answer does not come out right, then that will be the beginning of the torment for the person in the grave. This is why we have two talqeen. Talqeen is reminding a person of their, their, the main principles of their faith. There's one talqeen that is done at the hour of ihtadar, at the time of Death, at the time when the soul is leaving the body, you have someone from the relatives or someone comes and they start telling the person that is passing away, they tell them, say, God is my Lord. Say, the Quran is my book. Say, Rasulullah is my prophet. Say, the imams and naming the names of all the imams. And second, there's a talqeen that takes place right before the grave is closed, right before the soil is poured on the deceased, where a person reminds the soul, the soul can hear. The soul is reminded of the main principles and values of faith. Can a believer benefit from good deeds even after they die? Yes. If I do any good deed and gift it to the soul of a marhum, Allah Azza wa Jal will send the thawab to the grave of that individual. In a tradition, Imam Sadiq والسلام, was asked, Can we pray salah and gift it to someone that's dead? The Imam said, yes. And the individual, he could be in a difficult situation because he doesn't have enough good deeds. All of a sudden, Allah Azza wa will ease that discomfort. So he asks, what happened? Allah will tell him, Fulan, he did a good deed for you. He prayed and you received the thawab. In another tradition, the Imam says, The dead person will be happy. He will rejoice. When you do istighfar for him, Ask Allah Azza wa Jal to send mercy upon him. And all good deeds, just like you, living individuals, how you get happy when someone gives you a precious gift, it's like a gift that you are sending to the grave of that individual. You're there in that moment, which is called the wahsha, and the loneliness of that grave, because no one's there for you. Suddenly, an illuminating, radiating companion approaches you, and you say, please introduce who are you? What's going on? Another angel? And it turns out to be, I am your Qara'at Surah Al-Fatiha. I am your memorization of Ayat Al-Kursi. I am your Qul Allahu Ahad that you may have seen as maybe very brief, fickle possibly, potentially, not worth much merit. I now manifest in this good deed to help you in this situation. The squeezing of the grave, this is Adab Al-Qabr. This is something that will happen to many people. And in fact, we have traditions that say that from the Imam alayhi salam, Imam Sadiq, he tells his companions, he says, Adabu al-Qabr la yanju minhu illa al-Qaleel. Only a small group of people, they will be saved from Adab al-Qabr. And perhaps even some of the believers, perhaps even some of the mu'mineen. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised the mu'mineen that they will not Feel the pain of the hellfire. So because they're not going to be in the hellfire, there has to be a form of purification. There has to be a form of cleansing. And that cleansing takes place in the qabr. That cleansing takes place in the grave. And there was a famous companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by the name of Sa'd ibn Ma'ath. Sa'd ibn Ma'ath, he was injured in one of the battles with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They take him back to Medina and he passes away. The Prophet buries him, he leads the prayer, he enters into the grave with him. So his mother, she comes and she tells him, Ya Sa'ad, Hani'an lakal jannah. Oh Sa'ad, congratulations, you're going straight to paradise. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells her, Ya Umma Sa'd, la tuhattami ala Allah al-jannah, fa inna al-qabr dhammahu dhamma iltaqat fihi dhulu'ah. O mother of Sa'd, don't give up paradise on behalf of God. He is in the grave, his grave has crushed him in a way where his ribs have come together. So Sa'd was a good man. Sa'd is probably going to heaven. But then there needs to be a way of cleansing, of purification. And for the mu'min, for the believer, that is that cleansing and purification takes place in the grave. These graves are a reminder of the truth, the bitter truth of life, but at the same time, the sweetness of life as well. In that no matter how much you suffer, there's going to be a stop. We all want to stop at one point. Even if you're having ultimate fun and ultimate joy, there needs to be a moment where you have to stop and reflect. And the best place to do that is to come to these locations, to introspect, to have that hour of reflection, to remind yourself of the reality and the existence of the Akhirah because sometimes we forget, sometimes we become complacent. When I come here personally, I can't but become more thankful of the things that I have and start valuing the people that are near and dear and start taking responsibility in no longer wasting time in the fickleness that this life has to offer because there are many distractions. That the hayat al dunya is mata'ul ghurur. It's the pleasure of lies and deception. Yighr, as Amir al says, Ya dunya, ghurri ghayri. Deceive someone besides me because it's not going to happen today. I've already accepted this reality because Imam Amir al was a constant visitor. So let's make ourselves visitors until the day comes where we will be visited by the angel who will then help make that transition for us peace be upon the people of la ilaha illallah from the people of la ilaha illallah The word Barzakh is mentioned in the Holy Quran. وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Barzakh means a barrier between two things. And basically it's a transitionary period between this life and the Akhirah, meaning the Day of Judgment. So it's the period between we where we die until the Day of Judgment. So as soon as we die, our ruh, our soul is taken out of the body, the Barzakh life Begins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Hatta Ida Ja Haduhumul Mot, Kala Rabbir Jun, Lali Amalu Salihan Fima Tarakt, Kalla Innaha Kalimatun, Huaka Iluha, Wamin Wara Ihim Berzachun, Ila Yom Yubathun. Berzach is from the moment of death all the way until the day of judgment. Anything that happens in between the grave and the what, it, what the soul experiences from the moment of death all the way until the day of judgment, that is referred to as barzakh. Where is this barzakh? Is it in this world? Is it somewhere far in the universe? Scholars state that because barzakh is not a physical, fully physical life, it is somewhat physical, then it is intertwined with this dunya. Meaning that in the same way that we, there are angels, right? But we can't see them. The shaitan, we can't see him. There's many things that we cannot see because they are from a different realm. But these realms, they work together. So, alam al barzakh, it is in this world, but we just can't see it. And we have traditions, by the way, that tell us that the believers, after they die, their souls, they will all gather in Wadi Salam, in Najaf, in Al Kufa. They will all gather there. And they will spend time with each other communicating. Now, if you go, you won't be able to see it. Why? Because it's not fully physical, just like the angels we said. But it is on this dunya, but not a fully physical state. The people that were upright, mu'minun, they never violated the laws of Allah. And if they did, they immediately repented. They will be in the company of Muhammad and al-Muhammad. 
Salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhim. We have that narration, multiple by the way, that make mention everyone is gathered in that assembly. Judgment day has yet to happen, which determines you'll be in either hell or heaven. So where are we all in that process? We're in this barzakh, so expect to see others there. Tradition says that we're souls gathered in the valley of peace wadis salam and the souls will begin to have conversations and they will begin to ask how is my family member like did anything happen with my friend what's the news when they meet with each other yaltaqun they meet and they speak i haven't seen you in forever you must have just passed can i ask you about my family and the hadith makes mention that if a believer asks his fellow believer about someone that they're thinking about and if they're told, yeah, they also passed away but they don't see them among them in Wahd salam that means they went somewhere else and then they will begin to feel very disappointed that if they passed, they should be with us because we are the victors here but if they're not with us, that means Allah had something else reserved for them so there's a lot of conversing this is a hadith that indicates to us the presumption and the qarina that there's going to be communication, hanging out, interaction, and of course, like how everyone meets there, the members of Ahlul Bayt also are there. The upright companions of the Prophet, you will see all those gathered, and you will spend that time in that moment where you will feel the sense of relief and solace, like the hadith mentioned, you, as if you were wearing dirty clothes and put on fresh, clean, new ones. Allah, out of His Rahmah, punishes those that needed to be disciplined so that he saves them from bigger punishment. This can be seen in Barzakh. And so even then, while a person gets what they deserved, if through the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they need to be filtered because no one can get into heaven with a stain of disobedience, then Allah will filter them here and Allah will have them purified. Like how fire removes any impurity from rare gems and gold and things of that nature and these minerals, the soul likewise needs to be filtered. How does it do so? Unless if it's not disciplined through the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not going to say through the ghadab or the punishment. It's through the rahmah that Allah wa ta'ala does this. And yeah, they will be experiencing horrible um, experiences. They will see the angels Munkar and Nakir bash them in according to a tradition with a mallet. The grave turns into a pit of raging, roaring flames and fire. A tradition talks about a scent that if a journey of 10,000 years was to be made, it would still be overwhelming. And you just see these horrible characteristics and you begin thinking to yourself, is it worth it? That one second of disobedience in this life that gives me something like that. At the end of the day, Allah only wants the best for us. But if Allah even then decides to discipline us in the Barzakhi world, it is even from that a degree of His Rahmah. Today I had a few things on my mind. All of them went away. I was thinking about a commitment that I have to fulfill later on. I was thinking about my thesis that I'm working on. I was thinking about something that I still have yet to complete but I begun. All of that is no longer relevant to me. I'm speaking from my personal experience. There is a serenity, as ironic as it might feel, comparing a cemetery with serenity, but there is. And it comes because there's a, an assurance, knowing Alhamdulillah, there's an end to all of this. And there's a light at the end of the tunnel, inshallah ta'ala. And that light is the misbah al-huda, as the Messenger of God is. And that light is also Siraj and Munira. And that light is also the Mahdi. Because a guide can only guide you if they see the light and know where to take you. This stage of Barzakh will end with a sound of a trumpet. And that is the trumpet of Israfil. Israfil, the angel, will blow in the trumpet and every individual in Al-Barzakh will fully die. And Allah mentions that in the Holy Quran. Allah says that when that trumpet is blown, everyone will die. Now, once everyone dies, the Quran then says, 
ثم نفخ فيه أخرى because there's two times that Israfil will blow into in the trumpet. Once he blows again, the Quran says فإذا هم قيام ينظرون. Then this is where the resurrection will happen. Once Barzakh ends through the trumpet of Israfil, and then once again we are resurrected, this is when the last stage begins, يوم القيامة, the day of judgment. When the day of judgment begins, the Quran says it's one day, but it's 50,000 years long. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in one hadith says there are 50 stations because it's the day of reckoning. Allah will show me my deeds. Allah azza wa jal will bring witnesses. Allah will ask me to defend myself. And then Allah will weigh my good and bad deeds. So 50 stations that I have to go through all of them until finally the end is either paradise, inshallah, or may Allah azza wa jal save us from the fires of hell. Will everyone go through all the 50 stations? No. Some believers will be able to skip some stages and stations based on their deeds and their virtues. And that has been highlighted in the traditions of Ahlul Bayt in detail. In summary, while the discussion of death, mawt, akhira, hasra, al fawt, al maniya, all of these terminologies associated with passing and dying can come across as very heavy and overwhelming. At the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants from us and for us the pleasure and satisfaction that awaits. And the pleasure and satisfaction can only come when we're truly alive, when we are truly living. The Quran says that this world is a type of world. Lakin, wa inna dar al hayawan. But rather, afterlife, it's the real life and the real form of living. And so the journey from this life to the next will be as dramatic as the journey from the world of the womb of the mother to the world of this dunya. Imagine if that's all you ever knew. If you were once afraid, you now for a glimpse start looking forward to it. Because you say to yourself, God loves me and I love God back. And I know I have faltered, I fault. And I know I trip. And I know I have pitfalls in my life. But it's out of his rahmah that he gives me many chances and I will take these chances. And I won't miss out because this isn't the end. It is only the beginning. I proceed to where I was destined and ordained to go because I am from Allah and to Allah I shall return. Even if you don't accomplish what you set out to do, at least know that before everything closes and your chapter ends, that you gave it your best. Because there are people now among us and beneath us, some have wished they could at least have given a shot at trying to change, at trying to begin, at trying to seek pastures new. But no matter what we do, how many degrees we gain, how many zeros are in our bank account balance, what you really want is to know that you gave it your best. And to also have the satisfaction of the one who when we enter such cemeteries and such locations, we send salams with his testimony. As-salamu ala ahli la ilaha illallah. Min ahli la ilaha illallah. Peace be upon the people of la ilaha illallah. Because that's the only thing that will help us. It all comes from him. It all will be in his hands. And everything we chased from the glamour and not all that glitters is gold, we will always realize that it's all about you, Ya Allah. That's it. Everything else was just a bridge. Everything else. My religion, my role models, and the messengers you dispatched was always a bridge to you. Because I am running from you to you. Haribun mink ilayk, Ya Rabbal Alameen as we see in Dua Abi Hamza. And whenever your chest becomes constrained, then upon you is the remedy of visiting the cemetery. إِذَا ضَاقَتْ بِكُمُ الصُّدُورِ عَلَيْكُمْ بِزِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ Because that problem and that stress and that anxiety all dissipates, knowing that it's all temporary and this is permanent and we move on. Let us move on knowing we gave it our best and ultimately trying to attain his satisfaction and glory and rida inshallah ta'ala. And we ask Allah to 
raise us with like-minded mu'mineen and mu'minat as well. Many of them are with us here today. And so we ask them, inshallah, your place is good and hopefully our place will be as well.